All right, let's get started with chapter one, <clears throat> Concepts of Biology, and get the slideshow to get started here. All right, so finally, um, again, whether you buy a um, hard copy of the textbook, Concepts of Biology, or whether you just use an electronic version is up to you, but it is, as with pretty much every class, it is important that you do read the, uh, the book ahead of time and that you uh, review it again probably before each of the quizzes. So this class is actually going to start looking at the microscopic stuff, you know, talking about atoms and molecules, start building our way up to larger and larger scale, uh, all the way up to the level of the entire Earth. Different classes, different biology and environmental science type classes cover different scopes of things, but um, again, our main purpose is to um, give you an overview of biology, which literally means the study of life. You'll notice at the beginning of each chapter, there are going to be learning objectives listed. They're just kind of something that it would be good for you to review, give you a sense of uh, what you're going to be expected to know um, at the end of each uh, section of each chapter. So this, um, this section, we're going to start off talking about how to identify and describe what life is. They seem obvious, but there are probably some properties of life that you aren't aware of. Um, we'll describe the different levels of organization. Being um, curious things as humans are, we, you know, we're always interested in studying the world around us. So um, we've had to come up with a way of uh, organizing things so that it um, makes it manageable to actually study them. And then we'll look at the different disciplines of biology. So again, with pretty much every class, uh, you always want to kind of know exactly what it is. And you probably knew this, but um, biology is um, sort of a, a Latin-derived word. Bio means life. <clears throat> and the, um, the ology, anytime you see ology, ecology, um, anything like that, um, that's kind of Latin for, uh, for studying something. So biology is literally the study of life. And so if we're studying life, we, we obviously have to know what life is. And so we're going to go through and talk about uh, the eight properties of life. And so if you look at anything that's, um, that's alive or that is a type of life, it'll have the, the different um, uh, eight characteristics, each and every one of the eight characteristics. Again, we're going to start with, um, with microscopic stuff and work our way up to larger and larger things. Um, so everything from the individual atoms and molecules that are inside of uh, living things like this toad, to all of the uh, ways that cells can organize themselves into um, tissues, skin tissue, lung tissue, heart tissue, and then those tissues working together to form an organ like the heart or lungs, kidneys, and organ systems. Now, uh, this um, range of, of um, organization uh, tissues, organs, organ systems are covered in the book, kind of in the middle part of the book. But um, again, that's one of the areas that we're not going to talk about in this class simply um, because we don't have enough time to cover everything. So studying life is all about really being able to study the order uh, of life, how um, all living organisms are, are structured and uh, ordered uh, into systems. So even um, individual single-celled living organisms like a paramecium or euglena or an amoeba, even single-celled organisms like what we see on the slide here are still incredibly complex. 
even the simplest life is still very complex. So um, <clears throat> if you're considered to be a form of life, um, one of the things is that all life, all living things respond to stimuli. They respond to the environment around them. Plants can actually orient their leaves to follow the sun as it moves across the sky to maximize photosynthesis. Or if the, um, if the sun's really hot, say in a desert or redding <clears throat> in the summer, if the leaf is oriented directly at the sun, um, the leaf is going to kind of get like us if we're out in Reading in 115 degrees. So leaves can actually orient themselves the other way to minimize the amount of surface area. They may not respond as quickly as, as um, animals do. You know, quail running from the shade of one manzanita bush to the shade of another manzanita bush in the middle of summer to, uh, to minimize stress. But all living things do respond to stimuli. And again, those are environmental stimuli. Could be things like temperature, precipitation. It could be responding to other living things, predators trying to get a prey item. Um, so, so again, all life does respond to stimuli. There's a really interesting plant called the sensitive plant. And um, it actually has the ability to, uh, for the leaves to just kind of fold up when it's exposed to some sort of stimuli. And as I'm looking at this, I don't think I have the most recent version of my slideshow here on the screen. Um, if you uh, Google the sensitive plant, there's a video where you can see somebody just touching the leaf, running their finger down the leaf, and the leaves immediately start folding up. Again, a, a response to um, perhaps a predator that might start trying to eat the leaves or, or uh, something like that. So the plant can actually fold its leaves up. And it's actually quick. It, it happens literally right when the plants touch that the leaves will, will fold up. Also, life has to be able to reproduce, obviously. It's really only two goals uh, that life has to um, reproduce and to survive. And so uh, life has the ability to reproduce. And, and as we get into the class, we'll talk about reproduction at the cellular level. What you see happening here is uh, mitosis. So every one of these individual cells here that you see, these rectangular plant cells, every one of them goes through the process of making copies of itself. The DNA is duplicated, and then um, the plant cell goes through a process of mitosis. Here's one stage of mitosis called, uh, this would be maybe anaphase going into telophase. And then eventually this cell, these are the chromosomes, the cell would be uh, divided into two. So you go from one parent cell to ultimately having two daughter cells. So there's reproduction at the cellular level. <clears throat> Every one of the cells in our body are reproducing. And then there's obviously reproduction at the level of the entire organism. So whether you're a single-celled organism that duplicates by making copies of itself, or you're a, a, a larger organism like, like a human, uh, where you your cells are copying themselves and you uh, might actually um, reproduce and make a, a copy of yourself. Not an identical copy, but, but a, an offspring. Third uh, characteristic is that all living things have to adapt to their environment. They either have to adapt and find a way to fit their environment, or they might end up going extinct. Life um, comes and goes on this planet. Living things evolve, they, they adapt, and, uh, and then sometimes they survive for a very long time. Other times, uh, organisms just don't have the ability to adapt to whatever is happening in their environment, and then they go extinct. We'll talk more later in the semester about natural selection and, and the uh, theory of evolution. 
uh, but, but that's the basic way that living things are able to try to adapt to their environment. We typically might call it or, or give it a name, survival of the fittest. And so again, we'll talk more about that uh, a little later on in the semester. Living things also uh, have the ability or have to have the ability to grow and, and develop. Um, and so their, their genetics code for their ability to grow and develop. A human doesn't give birth to a frog. Our genetic code is to make us humans. And so from when an egg and a sperm create a new living thing, that single cell that gets fertilized by the sperm duplicates into two cells. Each of those cells duplicate into two cells. So from that one cell, you go to two cells, to four, to eight, to 16. And so the duplication keeps happening. And what drives that or, or controls it is our, um, our genetic instructions, the code that's inside of our DNA um, that, uh, again, patterns how living things grow and develop. There's a, a figure in the book that shows these four kittens. Even though they're all from the same parents, none of them look exactly alike. You can see the three on the left are, are a little more similar to each other. Numbers one and three are more similar to each other. Uh, and then you've got an orange one, but then you've got the, uh, the, the kitten that's totally a black hair. Again, even uh, though these are all different looking, they come from the same parents. Hair color is, is one of the many things that genes code for, and either parent can have some recessive genes or some characteristics that are expressed. Maybe the parents um, look more like this kitten, but maybe one of the parents of the parents um, was black-haired, and so then that can, can pop up. Again, we'll talk more about DNA and genes and things like that as the semester goes along. Living things also have need the ability to regulate themselves. Again, all living things are in their environment that has a certain you know, range of temperatures, places where it might snow or places where it might get 120 degrees in the summer. All living things have to have the ability to regulate their internal functions and respond to those different environmental stresses. We typically call um, the ability for living things to be able to uh, maintain themselves in a, in a steady state refer that uh, as homeostasis. Homeo meaning a stable or steady uh, stasis referring to um, the, uh, the, the condition of an organism. <clears throat> As we'll get into um, in, in a little while, every cell in us and in any other living thing need to have a certain range of conditions. If, it, if temperatures can't be too hot or too cold, the pH balance within our bodies has to be within a certain range. If the pH gets too high or too low, it can cause death. Um, all the different chemicals and things that are in living things all have to be within a certain level. Now, because of the environment you're in, because of things you ingest, those conditions can change. You know, you might drink orange juice in the morning. Orange juice is a really acidic drink. If that orange juice made our bodies more acidic uh, than they normally are just by drinking orange juice, um, it could kill our cells. But fortunately, our bodies and our cells have an ability to sort of balance that out, to counteract the effects of drinking things that are acidic, for example. And again, we'll talk more about that. So um, or organisms, all living things, are able to maintain their internal conditions within a fairly narrow range that's required for life, despite the fact that the environment around 
uh, us is constantly changing. Think about organisms like polar bears that live uh, way far north where it's ice covered a lot of the time where temperatures can be well below zero. Polar bears swim in, in an ocean that's right near freezing. If a human fell in 32 degree water, uh, we wouldn't last very long. Our bodies just aren't made to be in that kind of an environment. But bears can swim and, uh, and, and live in that kind of environment because they've evolved not only um, um, the ability to store a lot of fat, which is a good insulating layer, uh, but they also have specialized hair, multiple layers of hair that, uh, that work to keep the outside environment from <clears throat> reaching the actual skin of, uh, of the polar bear. Organisms also need the ability to process energy. Again, we have to, or other living things, have to ingest food, uh, energy in other words, to be able to fuel our cells, all the metabolic activities that are going on within our body. So we have to constantly have input of energy that our bodies can use, break down, build into other molecules that we need for our survival. With that said, if it weren't for some organisms and their special ability to actually take the only source of energy on this planet, which is the sun, maybe not, I shouldn't say the only, but the ultimate source of energy, um, fortunately some living things have the ability to take that energy and then convert it into the type of energy that we could utilize. You eat a salad or veggies or um, a hamburger. All of, uh, all of those food items basically were dependent on the sun. Plants directly converting that energy into chemical energy that um, can be uh, made into molecules like glucose, carbohydrates in other words, fats, lipids, proteins, and then... Um, and then we can eat those things to provide the energy our body needs to fuel <clears throat> all those activities that we, uh, that we need to, to do in our body. <clears throat> Anything, again, whether it's a condor, whether it's um, a microscopic organism or, or a human, we use energy just to exist. If you're, again, say the condor, you don't have food coming to you. You have to find the food. So basically, condors are, are scavengers like um, vultures where they soar around and they have a very sensitive uh, sense of smell, <clears throat> which is unique in birds. Most birds don't really smell, uh, don't have a sense of smell, but um, because condors are dependent on finding dead things to eat, they can smell um, the particular chemicals that are given off when um, something is decomposing. But they have to spend a lot of time soaring, flying, which uses a lot of energy. And so they then have to depend on finding food to replace the energy that it takes for them to find it. Living things are also um, highly organized and, and structured. Again, we're going to start talking about atoms, which are the smallest fundamental unit of matter. Again, there are smaller particles, but, but as far as the, the fundamental unit of, of matter or life, the atom is the smallest. When two atoms come together, they form molecules, which are... Um, chemicals that are structured where, again, they have at least two different atoms. So um, you have a, a, an atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen, CO2. So now we have a molecule that we call um, carbon dioxide. And those two atoms, that uh, the carbon and the oxygen atoms that are held together, are held together by chemical bonds, which we'll talk about in an upcoming section. We'll also talk about macromolecules, 
which are um, larger molecules that are formed by combining smaller units called monomers. Macromolecules are, are simply things like carbohydrates, and there are lots of different kinds of carbs, or proteins, and there are lots of different kinds of proteins. But all of those things, carbs, lipids, which are fats, proteins, um, are all molecules that our bodies need to, to fuel us. Um, another very important macromolecule is the um, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short, which again is important because it contains the instructions for how living things are what they are, how they look, how they act, everything about them is coded in that DNA. So there's a look at a DNA molecule. I always, it's called a double helix um, structure, but I always um, refer to it as kind of like a spiral staircase, right? You've got the steps of the staircase and then the, the you know, the, the part that, uh, that holds the steps upward. So it kind of looks like a spiral staircase. And again, we'll talk more about DNA and, and DNA structure a little later on. Other important macromolecules um, combine together to form organelles, which are basically like organs in, in us. We have hearts, well, we have a heart, uh, lungs, kidney, pancreas, lots of organs. Organelles are, are the equivalent sort of, but, but in microscopic living things. A little single cell um, paramecium or, or an amoeba don't have a heart and, and they don't have lungs, but they've got organelles that basically serve the purpose of um, doing everything <clears throat> that that living thing needs to survive. So again, looking at the, the structure, we go from the cell, which is the smallest unit of a living thing. Now, again, remember I said um, that um, atoms were the smallest kind of functional unit but um, of, of uh, matter, but as far as the smallest functional unit of a living thing, it's the cell. So again, two, two things that sometimes get confused. Cells are the smallest functional unit of a living thing. Atoms are the smallest unit of matter in general. Um, so it talks a little bit about viruses here. Um, we'll look at the different classifications of cells. They can either be prokaryotic or eukaryotic. We'll talk more about this um, a little later, but prokaryote, again, science and a lot of words you may not realize are based on Latin. And so um, pro in, in, in the sense of Latin refers to kind of like, like first or, or before. Before and, and karyote refers to the, the, the nuclear membrane. So every, every cell has a nucleus in it and that's where the DNA is housed. Prokaryotic organisms are, are single celled things. They don't have organelles that have membranes around them. So basically the stuff that makes that thing live and, and does everything it needs to do are just kind of in there. They're not organized as well as they are in eukaryotic organisms. So pro prokaryotes could be something like a, like a bacteria. Eukaryotic organisms are, are more developed higher forms of life. We fit as a eukaryotic. So we actually do have membranes around the organelles in every cell of our body. The nucleus of a cell in a eukaryotic organism has a membrane around it, and we'll, we'll see that when we talk more about them. Those um, cells combine to make tissues. Those tissues combine to make organs. Those organs work together as an organ system. Um, and so, for example, in, in vertebrates, again, humans are vertebrates, for example, but we have a lot of different organ systems like 
our circulatory system, and that basically moves blood around throughout our body, make sure all of our cells get um, bathed in oxygen and get nutrients transported <clears throat> where they're needed. Um, and, and we've got a lot of other organ systems. And then these organ systems all work together to make an organism, a whole single individual entity. Every one of um, us is, is one organism. A tree is, is a single organism. So again, life, uh, something needs to be organized to be considered um, a form of life. Near the end of the semester, we'll start getting into the bigger picture. We'll talk about populations, which are groups of uh, individuals that live in a given place at a given time. Populations of living things might include pine trees. Pine trees could be different kinds of pine trees, a white pine, a ponderosa pine. There could be other types of plants. In, in, uh, in that area, there could also be insects, there could be birds, there could be mammals. All of those populations, each population of different species, so the pine trees would be a population. Each of the different kinds of insects would each be a population. All of the populations in, a, in an area um, combine together to be termed a community. So these are all of the populations that are in a given area. And also, it's important to realize these populations interact with each other. Not everything eats everything else or, or uh, you know, has a direct interaction with everything else. But if they're in the same place at the same time, um, they're, they're going to interact with each other at some level. And then when you add up all of the aspects of the community, which are all living things, and then you add in the non-living parts of the environment, and what might those be? Things like rocks, the, the soil itself, the air, you know, the, the, the temperature, precipitation, all those are non-living parts of, of an environment. And so when you add up the living and the non-living parts of the environment, now we're calling that an ecosystem. The biotic, which is the living, and the abiotic, which is the non-living parts of the environment. And so there's a figure in your book, um, 1.8, which then ends talking about the biosphere, which are all of the ecosystems on the earth. Uh, and all of those combined together make the biosphere, or again, sometimes you could just say it's, it's Earth. <clears throat> so there's um, uh, figure 1.8 that again shows you the organization of life from the atom, the basic unit of matter, to the molecules. Again, those form organelles, organelles combine to form um, cell or cells in the human body. The cells like blood cells are important for, for transporting oxygen around the body. Cells can combine to form different types of tissue like skin. Uh, all of those different tissues can form organs and organ systems. Those organ systems then form organisms. All of the organisms in a given place at a given time make a population. Remember all the populations in an area of different living things make a community. And again, these are all living things. Then when we add in the abiotic environmental factors, then those all form with the living things to make ecosystems. And then if you look at all of the ecosystems on the planet, collectively we refer to that as the biosphere. <clears throat> and 
near the very end of the semester, we'll talk about diversity. But um, diversity is a really important concept in, in all of the different studies of biology. Earth has a lot of diversity on it. And again, that just means all of the different varieties of living things on the planet, the different types of life on the planet. Everything from, again, bacteria, single-celled, microscopic things to the biggest living things on the planet, like blue whales or giant sequoia trees. Diversity is a result of evolution, the process of species adapting and gradually changing over time. New species evolving from older species. In areas where there's a lot of um, diversity of, of plants, there are going to be a lot more diversity in animals. Areas near the equator um, tend to have a lot more diversity in general than areas, uh, you know, near the polar regions. And that has to do with um, a more consistent climate, basically, that you have near the equator. All right, had a little glitch there, sorry about that. So um, the next topic deals with um, how we as humans have developed a system to understand that diversity. Um, again, when there are literally millions of different types of living things on the planet, you can't study them all at once. You can't think about them all in, in one big lump. You have to study individual parts, uh, different parts of the earth, different individual living things. And so um, since humans have been thinking about the world around us, we've always used different ways to, to organize life. Um, basically, the system we use today, though, is uh, from the 18th century and a scientist named Carl Linnaeus. He's the one that basically came up with the system we use today. There's not really a right or wrong way of organizing things. I mean, back in, in, in uh, Greece and, and ancient Rome, when people would be studying the world around them, they might have organized things in, in more general ways. If it can fly, then it's one kind of thing. Now we know birds fly, and birds are different than, say, a grasshopper that can fly, or a bat that can fly, or a squirrel that doesn't really have wings. There are flying squirrels. I'm not talking about the ground squirrels that suddenly just jump in the air and start flying away. But there are these little squirrels called flying squirrels. They don't really have flight. They can only kind of glide. They, they jump out of a tree and they've got skin flaps between their front and hind limbs and they can stretch their legs out and that just kind of allows them to glide a little bit and jump out of a tree and maybe get away from a predator. But it, it may have been that, um, you know, thousands of years ago, anything that had the ability to fly might have been put in one category. Of course, again, today we know that the birds are different than bats and, and, and uh, flying insects, but there, there were different ways we might have organized life. So Linnaeus is the, the guy who proposed the system that we use today. And that system of uh, taxonomic hierarchy is based on going from categories of living things that have very general things in common with each other and this is the category we call a domain. So there's a domain that has the eukaryotic organisms in it. Remember, I used that term a few minutes ago. And so everything from a dog to a human to a bat, fish snake, worm, moth, paramecium, a tree, are all similar in that we all are eukaryotic organisms. Each of our cells are eukaryotic. Again, we'll, we'll talk more about what that word means uh, again later. 
And so then his system goes from being able to put things in very broad categories to more and more specific categories until you get to the category called a species, of which there's only um, one version of. So in this case, we're tracking the species Canis lupus, which would be like your pet dog. And by the way, all dogs are derived from wolves. So genetically, your dog, whether it's a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, uh, is uh, basically a wolf, DNA-wise. So we're tracking the dog, but then going from, again, the really general characteristics, we start narrowing it down. So this, uh, this, uh, the dog is in the kingdom called Animalia. So now these are only things that are animals. Notice in the domain Eukarya, we also had plants. So now we only have animals. Then we go to even an, a more specific classification. Now the category called a phylum. Chordata in this case is where the dog fits. These are animals that have spinal columns. So that's why the worm and the moth are gone. They're animals, and they're in a different phylum than the dog because they don't have spinal columns like, um, like dogs do. And then we can go into the next more specific category, which is mammalia. So now these are all living things that are considered to be mammals. Mammals have hair on their body. They give birth to live young. They feed their young the milk. Uh, from produced by mammary glands, and there are a few other characteristics. So we've gotten rid of fish and snakes. They're in different classes, reptilia for the snake, and then there are a couple different categories where fish could fit into, and those are classes. Then we go to the next more specific level of organization called an order, and again, we're tracking the dog. So the dog is in the order Carnivora. So these are, as you can maybe tell, um, animals that have backbones that are mammals that eat meat. So humans actually don't fit here because we're not strictly carnivores. Mice eat things like seeds. Bats can actually be um, fruit eaters. Uh, they can eat other things as well. Um, so We've got uh, the order Carnivora. Now we go to the family that the dogs are in called Canidae. Think of a, a dog generically referred to as a canine. That's what it's referring to. So again, we lose the lion and the seal now, uh, which are in different, each of them are in separate order, uh, separate families. Bears are in Ursidae. Um, cats are in Felidae. Um, the seals are in pinnipedia, pinnipeds are a different category. Uh, and then we get to the genus, canis, so dogs, wolves, coyote are still in the genus canis, foxes are in a different genus, uh, actually it could be a different ones, uh, vulpes, red foxes, vulpes, um, so even though they kind of are related, they're, they're closer to being a dog than a lot of other things, but they're not, not, a, not strictly speaking a dog. And then we get to the species, Canis lupus. So probably important to, to be able to, um, uh, you know, memorize this order. So in a multiple choice question, I might list domain, kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, species, and it might be in different orders. And you have to pick which one would be the correct order, for example. So the, um, there are basically three domains, Eukarya, which is the one we were tracking that the dog is in, Archaea, uh, which is a category reserved for microscopic um, living things, bacteria are different enough that they get their own um, separate domain, um, and then the domain Eukarya uh, contains separate categories, fungi are in a separate category, plants are in their own category, animals in their own, 
and then a couple of other kingdoms of protists, which are categories of other microscopic living things that are different than bacteria or archaea. Um, and so basically, again, we've developed this system as a way to be able to understand all of the, the crazy diversity of living things on the planet. We also study um, how related living things are to each other by constructing phylogenetic trees. These are diagrams that show the relatedness among living things based on different traits or genetics. And so the more close two things are to each other on the phylogenetic tree um, indicates that they're more like each other than things they're farther away from. So for example, uh, here is the star where animals are. Again, we've got the, um, the broad domains here, bacteria in, in the purplish color, archaea in the reddish color, eukarya in the brown. Again, all the animals are here. So basically this is a phylogenetic tree. See how it kind of resembles a tree, right? The main stem, branches, forks in the tree. Tree of life is another way that we refer to these things. And so basically what it's saying is that animals are more related to fungi, for example, or even plants than animals are related to any of these other categories. So again, the, the more close you are on this tree, the more related you are. Things that are farther away are less similar to us. Things that are up this other branch are less similar to us. We're more similar to archaea than we are to bacteria because, again, the diagram shows genetically and characteristic-wise they're farther away from us, so that implies that they are less similar to us. All right, good place to take a breath, pause the slideshow if you want, um, come back to it later. I'm going to do each lecture, lecture straight through, but I understand time-wise, you know, your, your time, whatever, um, could, you know, be 15 minutes at a time, half an hour at a time. So feel free to pause the, the uh, presentation at any time, and then you can always go back to it, start it up again. I guess that's the great thing about online classes. You can sort of do it at your own pace. <clears throat> All right. So biology isn't just biology. Biology in general is a really broad scope of, of discipline of which there are a lot of subdisciplines. Within biology, you could focus on studying molecular stuff, looking at the microscopic part of the world. You could study specifically um, DNA. You could study, you know, um, like, like medicine is a branch of biology, studying uh, the human body, interacting with patients to, to help them. So biology is, is a really broad thing and has a lot of specific disciplines within it. A lot of times people just don't really know what, what the possibilities are until they um, do a little research. And, and I, I mean, I didn't know. I started out just as a biology major, um, although I was most interested in, in animals. After a couple of years of college doing a biology degree, I found that there were colleges that had specific programs in wildlife management. I figured that out, and then that clicked with me. That's what I knew I wanted to do. But I started out not even knowing that you could be more specific than just biology, and, and you definitely can. There, there are way too many sub-disciplines of biology to be able to list here. Your book 
talks about a number of them. Um, there's some links at the top of the Canvas page to a website called KQED. It's out of the Bay Area. Lots of really fun and interesting videos that you can watch. Uh, and, and there are many um, areas within the website, the KQED website, that talk about careers. Maybe you're interested in science or biology or plants or animals or something, but you're not really sure what you would need to do to get a job working at a zoo or managing wildlife or studying the environment, fixing, you know, addressing pollution, that kind of stuff. By the way, if you have any questions about that, you know, don't ever hesitate to email me. Um, you know, career questions or anything. I'll do my best to answer anything, help get you on the right pathway. Because you don't know in, unless you figure something out, right? You don't know something unless you research it or you ask somebody about it. Science, biology, environmental science, jobs like that, wildlife, forestry can be really rewarding, fun. If you like being outside, uh, help the environment, um, but uh, but again, you may just not know what the possibilities are. Here we have some um, some paleontologists excavating some dinosaur fossils. Paleontology, obviously, one realm of biology. Forensic science um, became a lot more on the forefront when. Shows like the original CSI started on TV. People started looking at that and saying, that'd be kind of fun doing that kind of stuff. Sort of like being a detective, right? There's a crime. You collect data, just like any other scientist. You analyze the data. And the hope is that you can use that data analysis to, um, to figure out who did something to solve a crime. So again, just one aspect of science as well, but there are um, uh, programs at colleges where you can get a degree in forensic science, being a being a uh, forensic scientist. <clears throat> the next section in the book is called the process of science, and so then uh, again we list the um, the sort of the learning objectives, uh, the things that we want you to get out of this section of the book. This is a biology class, obviously. One of the underlying things that, that we want everybody who takes this class to get from it is to understand the process of science. Throughout this semester, um, we're going to be referencing things related to this. And um, basically, understanding how science works is important because whether you're a scientist or not, you have to be able to understand uh, the process of science. All right, sorry about that. So the dangers of doing this at home is you <clears throat> might easily get distracted by something. Um, so again, just uh, to get back where I was, one of the main underlying goals is that, again, everybody leave this class with a basic understanding of science, the process of scientific inquiry, how scientists use reasoning to come to conclusions, definitely based on gathering data to make decisions. Some images of some of the uh, diversity of life on the planet. So all science, again, whether it's geology, whether it's physics, chemistry, environmental science, wildlife management, forestry, are all types of science whose goal is to gather information, gather knowledge about the world around us, study the world around us. Sometimes it's just about um, studying something for the sake of studying it. I wonder why those things are the way they are. So just again, out of, out of curiosity, human nature, again, is that we're curious about stuff. Sometimes the research is done so that we can solve a problem. 
we um, humans have created a lot of problems on the planet for, for animals and plants. So sometimes a wildlife biologist might need to understand how, um, how something like a herd of deer uh, manage to survive, what kind of food they need, what kind of habitat they need. And uh, this may be because maybe something becomes endangered. Uh, an animal like the California condor starts declining or disappearing. We have to study that animal in order to find a way to stop it from becoming extinct. Or we might study the environment to try and solve a problem that's a human issue. Every, probably every day, every year, scientists are discovering plants and animals that might have chemical properties that could help treat diseases. So the discoveries that biologists make can range from just something interesting, kind of stuff you might watch on Animal Planet or the Planet Earth series, just understanding, enjoying the world around us. Or it could be solving a problem or, or curing a disease. But science as a whole work together to um, to have designed methods and processes that everybody does the same way, which again is, is basically scientific inquiry. So all science includes making careful observations, keeping track of, of data, record keeping, doing um, reasoning, whether it's logical reasoning or mathematical reasoning, conducting experiments to understand um, how things are uh, affected, and then publishing that information so that other scientists can read it, they can scrutinize it, they can comment on it, and, uh, and then build on that knowledge. Get rid of the stuff that's garbage, and there is garbage, excuse me, unfortunately, in science, but um, keep building on the knowledge that we have so that we can continue to grow and, um, and widen our, our understanding of the world around us. Science isn't only just this kind of strict regimented black and white either though. There is creativity and imagination involved in solving these problems. Thinking about a new way to design an experiment that someone else hadn't thought of before. Um, yeah, we, we, we don't use the phrase thinking out of the box much anymore, but that's still kind of what it is. Bringing creativity, your own individuality, to the way that you approach studying science. But still having, again, a process that we follow that we'll talk about. So science means basically knowledge from the Latin root word, knowledge about the natural world. But again, science is a very specific way of gaining knowledge about the world around us. And that's via what we call the scientific method. It's a, a process that, again, has been, um, been used now for a very long time. And all science, all scientists are expected to follow this process. Otherwise, we can't trust that the science is any good. One of the most important parts of this scientific method is called testing hypotheses. A hypothesis is basically an educated guess. It's an explanation for whatever it is that you're observing. So science develops hypotheses about the observations we make, and then those hypotheses are what we actually would design and experiment and then test to that hypothesis. Do the results then um, support the hypothesis or do they not? We actually learn more if the hypothesis isn't supported um, because then we know that's not the reason and we can move on and test a different hypothesis or keep testing that same hypothesis until we're pretty confident that we've gotten whatever answers we can get. So 
this uh, class, biology, focuses on natural sciences, things that deal with the physical world, but even only a small part of that. Again, physics is a natural science. Um, astronomy is a natural science, and, and those are completely separate courses, but, but all still within the same realm of what we call natural sciences. And so scientific inquiry then is basically a way that we go about trying to gain knowledge about the environment around us. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about, about the scientific method in, in a moment. But part of that, remember, I said was um, applying logic, logical thinking, reasoning, inductive and deductive reasoning, are um, <clears throat> different ways that scientists go about looking at information and coming up with conclusions about that information. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, you can uh, read this section in the book, look at, at the notes. But um, inductive reasoning basically, like any other reasoning, involves... There's an observation, you see something in the, in the natural world that you want to understand. You look for patterns that might help you explain that. Then a hypothesis is formed, and then you test those hypotheses until maybe you are eventually able to formulate a theory. So that's one way of, uh, of reasoning. Deductive reasoning is actually sort of the exact opposite of that. You actually, <clears throat> based on observations, um, you develop a theory first that explains something. <clears throat> then you form a hypothesis, then you test it, and then either that theory is confirmed or not based on the testing and observations that you made. So both of these types of reasoning are used in science, and, and you know, there's some examples here uh, that the book shows. Um, but basically, they're, if you think of it, they're sort of opposite of each other, opposite ways of, uh, of approaching uh, reasoning, scientific reasoning. Also, two broad ways that we can approach science, either from a descriptive standpoint and this is mostly the kind of stuff you see when you watch television programs about nature. You're just looking at stuff. You're, you're observing it. You're exploring it. You're looking at it. You're discovering things. But, but science is, real science is more hypothesis-based that you have the observation and then you formulate a specific question, in other words, a hypothesis, and then you test that hypothesis and you evaluate the results and then you start all over again. You test that hypothesis again and go through the process and get results and analyze and come up with conclusions and then you keep doing that over and over and over again. And if you do it over and over and over again enough times, you eventually keep getting the same results, which then can lead you to say that's a theory, like the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is, is a theory now because for a very long time, a lot of scientists were testing hypotheses about evolution. And based on getting similar results, over 100 plus years, eventually you can then believe that that can now be a theory. But again, um, whereas there is descriptive science, which is fun and interesting and a way to discover the environment, true science should be hypothesis-based, where you formulate a hypothesis and test it and analyze the results. So we study the world by questioning, by 
analyzing results. And again, that's the scientific method. So figure 1.18 <coughs> here kind of shows the process that I've been describing in a flowchart sort of form. That we make the observation, we ask a question, that leads us to generate a hypothesis. We can then make a prediction, we do the experiment, we analyze the results. If the hypothesis is supported, we report the results. If it's not, we still report the results. But either way, we always go back to the, we try again. We form another hypothesis, or maybe we test the same one again. So science never stops. There's never like, okay, we're done now. Even theories like evolution are still being tested. Different hypotheses are still being tested. And maybe someday a scientist will get a different answer than the one we have now, and they'll report those results, and that'll lead us to maybe eventually having a different theory. But it's really important to understand that science, if it's good science, it follows this process and it never ends. Science is constantly going back and testing and reevaluating. If not, it's, it's not good science. So your book gives a simple example of how the scientific method might be used, but in maybe an everyday situation. Get up in the morning, got to make a piece of toast and head off to work. Put a piece of toast in there and, and the toaster isn't working. So that's an observation. That bread is not toast, it's still bread. Leads to a question. Why didn't my toaster make toast? Leads you to a hypothesis. Could be a lot of hypotheses, but maybe the first one you test is the outlet isn't working. So you formulate a way to test that hypothesis. If something's wrong with the outlet and I plug something else in that outlet, it wouldn't work either. So maybe you move the coffee maker over, plug it in the outlet, and you find out that after you plug the coffee maker in, the coffee, does, the coffee maker does work. So what you've done now is you've made an observation, you've asked a question, You've generated one of maybe a lot of possible hypotheses. You've tested it. You've analyzed the results. And what does that lead you to do? Give up. Oh, damn it, I can't have toast this morning. I'll just go to Starbucks and buy something. Well, maybe, but what it should lead you to do is go back and address the original question and then formulate a new hypothesis. So maybe in this case, I know the outlet works, that's not the problem. Maybe it's the toaster. So then you um, maybe have to go buy a new toaster, but it's gonna lead you to circle back until you get a resolution to that problem. So science follows that same exact idea, just maybe on a bigger scale than just your uh, toaster not working. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes we study the world around us just because, because we can, because we want to. If we're just studying the environment, something in the environment, just to learn more about it, we would call that basic science, pure science, just gaining knowledge to expand our, our human knowledge about the world around us, life around us. Basic science doesn't really focus on, on developing um, a process. It's not focused on, on using that information. It's just, just gaining the information. So the immediate goal of basic science is just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We're not trying to find a way to use that knowledge. And so there's, there's that side of science. But um, applied science is science that tries to basically observe something, study it, and then use that information to fix a problem. Again, it could be to, to be able to grow crops that yield more food. 
It might be to find a cure for a disease. Again, I used an example of maybe um, being able to save an animal from going extinct, study that animal, figure out why it's not doing well, and then uh, use that knowledge to hopefully do something to keep it from going extinct. In applied science, usually there's a problem that we're specifically trying to address. And that's already something we have defined for us, unlike basic science, where it's just, just out there looking, seeing what there is to see, studying stuff just for the, for the fun of that. The Human Genome Project was a good example of an applied science project. It was a 13-year effort among a lot of different researchers to basically map the human genome. Uh, and again, the application there is if you can figure out where diseases occur, what genes can cause defects, uh, or what, where a specific predilection for a disease, maybe you uh, have a um, history of high cholesterol in your family, being able to identify where that gene might reside could mean in the future that we could go in there, scientists could go in there and fix the gene. We already can do that a little bit today, but, um, but we're not there yet to be able to totally cure any disease. But first step is to know where, what each of the genes in our chromosomes do. And so then we can maybe apply that knowledge in the future in some way to benefit humankind. A really important part of science, though, also is not that you just do the research, that you study something, but that ultimately you, you publish that information. If it's in my head or, or it's sitting on my desk, it doesn't do anyone any good. I might have come up with, with the most crazy discovery. And um, if I don't publish it so other people can see it and, and read about it, um, it's, it's, it's not valuable in any way. So in, in science, we, we um, tend to publish in what are called peer-reviewed articles. So in a journal like the journal Wildlife Management, if I were to submit an article, research that I did, it would be sent off to a bunch of other sci scientists that review it. So those would be my peers, other scientists that understand what it is I'm talking about. And they review my paper. They mark it up, comment on it, make sure the science is sound, my, my methods were good, my conclusions make sense. And then eventually, um, if, if everything's good, then your, your work might get published. And then it would be available in a written form for other scientists to read and learn from, build on. Um, and maybe they even read my research and think of a different way to use it than I thought of. But again, if it isn't published, if it's not out there, um, it doesn't do, do any good. All right, so... That is the end of uh, the lecture on chapter one. I will uh, continue to keep creating these, um, these lectures in this format for you. And um, as always, as you read the book, as you go through these lectures, if you have questions, feel free to email them to me or post them in the announcements. Maybe even other students might be interested in the questions that you have. I really recommend that you visit the um, KQED website that I mentioned. A link uh, is available near the top of the Canvas website. And, and again, please, if, you, if there's anything you don't understand uh, or you want to talk more about, please don't hesitate to email me. It's important in an online class that there's um, contact, you know, that there's interaction between you and I. This is just you watching me talk, obviously. I don't do any live chat rooms in this class, um, so it, it really is important that we 
talk with each other via email or again I'll post announcements and um, feel free if you have questions to post them in the announcement as well all right so make sure you read um, chapter 2 then before you go uh, to the next lecture